Good afternoon, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this roundtable. My name is Antonino Salmeri. I am policy analyst at the Open Lunar Foundation, and I will be your moderator for today. It's a great pleasure welcoming everyone, and in particular, our distinguished lineup of speakers on this roundtable on interoperably and safely operating on the moon, a case for enhanced information sharing. We are gathered here today to discuss um, let's say building blocks, as uh, we may be familiar with the terms, or foundation steps uh, towards the development of practices that can help the safe, peaceful, rational, and sustainable development of the moon. And uh, I'm very grateful to the Paris Peace Forum uh, for giving us the opportunity to bring this um, topic to your attention today. As you may have heard, uh, the Peace Forum is already engaged with uh, a lot of space discussions. We uh, had the opportunity to look at very interesting roundtables moderated by some of our speakers on uh, space debris and the zero, zero net space initiative. And today we are adding a new topic to the track addressed in the Paris Peace Forum on uh, lunar activities with specific focus on information sharing. Today, uh, hopefully, will be just the beginning of a discussion that can be facilitated by the framework of the forum. Uh, and uh, we have a very distinguished lineup of speakers joining us, and I'm very pleased to welcome each and every one of them. The format will be um, the following. We will begin with some introductory remarks meant to be prompts for conversation, and then we will engage, hopefully, in a very active and lively discussion among uh, the speakers. We also have two speakers joining us online. Um, we will discuss mainly two issues today. One is the key elements for information sharing, and in particular, the why, the what, and the how. And then we will also um, take a moment to discuss what could be next steps to develop practices and uh, standards of behavior, if we wish, uh, for the development of information sharing practices over the course of the next years. So without uh, further ado, I would like to uh, open our round table. I will pass the floor now to uh, Dr. Emmanuel Bourdon, uh, legal consultant from the Ministry of Europe and Foreign Affairs in the French government, just to set the scene of the round table within uh, the PPF, uh, and then we will go to our initial speakers. Because we only have one hour, as you have seen already from other roundtables, I will ask everyone to keep their remarks as brief as possible, around two or three minutes maximum, so that we can, everyone, we can give everyone the opportunity to speak and we can touch upon as many topics as needed. So Dr. Bourdon, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. And, uh, um, very nice to, to, to meet you all, and uh, I just want to, to be brief, like you said. Um, as a member of the F French Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I will start by thank you all to be here and to participate to this round table. Uh, in particular, I want to congratulate the PPF uh, team for their work, and uh, especially thank Jerome and Maria uh, for the organization of this uh, round table. Um, to, to, to say, to say in, a, in a quick word, uh, the PPF is born from uh, an observation that uh, we, we share at the Ministry that the global problems without cooperative solutions lead to conflicts and um, co collaboration is increasingly difficult as countries are turning inward and today in many areas the international community fails at producing the, the needed solutions. Consequently, the Paris Peace Forum established a platform open to all seeking to develop coordination rules and capacities uh, that answer global problems. In a way, its mission is to contribute to bridging this governance gap in bringing together all stakeholders to advance concrete solutions where none exist. And the PPF supports, improves, and complements multilateral institutions. So from a French point of view, uh, we totally share this view and this uh, goal, and consequently, it's always a pride and a pleasure to host uh, the, the PPF, especially this year, in an in-person format uh, that was not possible the, the past few years. And in this context, outer space issues are obviously a challenge that the PPF must be interested in. Uh, maybe than many other challenges, outer space must be managed through a multilateral and global governance. Among all the challenges presented by the current new era of space matters, space resources seems to be an obvious topic for the PPF, and I'm very happy when I heard it uh, it's, uh, at the forum agenda this year, and I hope it will be the case for the, the next year too. I, I won't 
remind to so many experts of this subject, how space resources issues uh, is a key issue for the coming years for space exploration. But I want to highlight how the PPF is a relevant platform to have such a discussion. Uh, this matter raises global governance issues, and it calls for shared and pragmatic solutions uh, which benefit to all. It's also a public and private matter which required to be addressed through a discussion involving different stakeholders. So the, the choice made to tackle the space resources issue through uh, information sharing question is also a very relevant choice and uh, because it's a first and pragmatic step to have in order to launch initiatives and to imagine governance solutions. And I hope the, the, the coming year will allow to have a more and more substantive and useful discussion about practices and standards you, you just uh, recall. It's also a way to address to one of the goals of the, uh, of the PPF to support and to complement, all, to complement multilateral institutions. And um, indeed, and I conclude by this, this round tab table can also be viewed as a very inf useful input for the working group dedicated to this issue at the COPUS, and it reflects how much uh, the PPF <coughs> is a useful complement to existing institutions. So thanks, and uh, I'm looking forward to, to having this, uh, this discussion today. Thank you very much, and yeah, we're very delighted also to have Professor Stephen Freeland with us today, joining the round table. So we'll turn to him uh, in a brief moment to also hear the perspective of the Vice Chair of the UN Working Group on the legal aspects of space resource activities. But now let's um, begin with our substantive discussion on issue one, so key elements of information sharing, uh, the rationale, what is, uh, that it, what is that we want to share, what it should be shared, and then the processes uh, for doing that. And to begin with, I would like to give the floor to Emily Pierce, who is Attorney Advisor at the US State Department. Emily, thank you so much for joining, and the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Anthony Now, and thanks to you and to the Paris Peace Forum for inviting me to participate. It's an honor to be here. Um, the notion of lunar information sharing is key to the success and safety of our collective exploration plans and is central to the theme of the Artemis Accords. Despite the breathtakingly uh, large expanse of outer space, it turns out that uh, currently the most practical and scientifically, scientifically interesting places on the moon are much more limited, uh, much more limited. Um, within the last couple of weeks, the Office of Technology, Policy, and Strategy, OTPS, at NASA released a report entitled Lunar Landing and Operations Policy Analysis, which opens by stating, quote, just within the next four years, we expect to see at least 22 lunar surface missions, half of these missions will occur in the moon's south polar region." Close quote. Multiple actors and missions operating in proximity to one another on the lunar surface present challenges that are ripe for discussions like this one. The NASA report identifies key issues to address when, when planning its lunar operations, and virtually all of the issues highlighted in the report from landings to surface operations, lunar surface transit, radio frequency interference, impacts to areas with special characteristics, human heritage protection, um, all of these necessitate information sharing and transparency among all involved. Lunar information sharing will be needed to help ensure the safety of those activities, in particular for humans, prevent potentially harmful interference among different surface operations, ensure free access on the lunar surface, a freedom that all states parties to the Outer Space Treaty en enjoy through coordination and deconfliction, prevent misunderstandings about the purpose of operations, and ensure we are operating on the moon in a way that is sustainable. We also need information sharing well before the operational uh, operations take place so that appropriate mechanisms and tools that can facilitate operational information sharing, coordination, and deconfliction can be developed among countries. For the United States, that will involve working with our Artemis program partners, uh, with whom we'll be working on the lunar surface, as well as other accord signatories. 
uh, but sharing through other bilateral channels as well as broader multilateral discussions will also be needed, as Emmanuel noted in his opening remarks. Um, the UN Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space will be a key multilateral forum for these discussions, and very happy to see uh, Stephen Freeland with us today, um, particularly the, the recently established working group on space resources in the legal subcommittee um, is going to be key. There's going to be a lot of information that needs to be shared in that working group um, over the course of its work plan and collecting this information, including evolving plans for exploration, exploitation and utilization of space resources is critical to providing a basis upon which the working group can do its work. Um, in the previous uh, space focus session at the Peace Forum, um, it was noted uh, that the lawyers need to understand what the operations are. And as a lawyer, I couldn't uh, agree more. We need the lawyers who are going to be establishing and developing the rules really need to understand the science and the operations um, so that we uh, have a basis upon which we can do our work. And then lastly, it's a, you know, as a lawyer, I, I, I'm putting this last, although in my, in my heart it's first. Mm -hmm. It's important to recognize the need to comply with our international obligations, many of which involve information sharing. As a starting point, Article 11 of the Outer Space Treaty, um, under that article, we've all agreed to inform the United Nations, the global scientific community, and the public at large of our activities in outer space, including the moon, uh, to the greatest extent feasible and practicable. And, uh, in particular, in this context, uh, we'd highlight disseminating as broadly as possible the results of our scientific endeavors on the moon, which is a benefit that um, all can uh, enjoy. Uh, so thanks again, uh, and thanks for your kind attention, and I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Thanks a lot, Emily, and thanks also for underlining the need for proactive information sharing, because I think that's going to be key for the purpose of ensuring safety, coordination, and also um, preventing these misunderstandings that can happen. So timing will be of the essence, I would say, and multidisciplinarity as well. That's why I'm very happy also that uh, we can have a diverse discussion in terms of including also the technical people and hopefully within the context of uh, COPUS, this can also mean engagement within the legal and technical subcommittee on these issues. I'm very much looking forward to see developments in that area. Uh, I will now like to turn to Charlotte Nasse from uh, iSpace Europe, uh, who will uh, give some remark on the industry perspective on what could be shared and what is important from their side to keep in mind when thinking about information sharing. Uh, Charlotte, the floor is yours. Thank you, Antonino. Hello, everyone. Thank you for uh, inviting a private actor to this discussion. Uh, I think that's quite important. Uh, so to give you a little bit of context about iSpace and what we do, we are a lunar exploration company um, developing our own landers and rovers for the moon. And we are launching our first mission to the moon before the end of this month. So when we land, we will be amongst the first commercial missions to achieve that ever. So as private operators on the moon, information sharing is crucial to our operations. However, information sharing also carries a significant amount of risk for the viability of our commercial activities. So Antonino asked me to say a few words about what type of information should we share. And I think we can all agree that the information that we should share is the information that will ensure safe and sustainable activities on the moon for all. So what does that mean? Well, we've mentioned it, the timing and location of landings, for instance, uh, the general type of operations that actors will be undertaking. And that is essential to avoid interferences, both on the surface and in orbit. Talking about orbits, the time and location of orbiters will be developing communication and navigation on the moon, and that it can potentially hinder the access to the surface. So that information will also have to be shared. And learning from the mistakes that we've made on Earth, space debris could potentially cause a huge threat to lunar activities. So um, sharing information about space debris will be essential to protecting activities both in orbit and on the surface. So that's a brief overview of the type of information that we'll be sharing. 
but I wanted to underline that as commercial operators on the moon, the type of information we want to share is the type of information that will not compromise our commercial interest. And so when sharing about the natures of the activities that we'll be undertaking, we need to do that in a way that also protects us. And that is already possible. We can find inspiration in national regulations relating to mission authorizations, for example. That exists already today. So on the international level, um, if we assume that we could have a dedicated institution to collect this information and, and share it, to be a bookkeeper for all of this, we would need to ensure the independence of that institution. That would also determine the level of participation of actors, both public and private, in the information sharing scheme. So to wrap up, uh, iSpace, as one of the commercial pioneers on the moon, will support and collaborate in setting up the necessary structures uh, to enable our vision for the moon, but also the vision of humanity in general. But what information that we share and the amount of detail could threaten uh, the development of a strategic and strong cislunar economy with the participation of private actors. Therefore, the strategic commercial interest of private actors will need to be protected in our discussions. And considering that our company will be one of the companies really enabling frequent, affordable, high value science, also for public actors, it is in everyone's interest to ensure that our business isn't threatened by the type of information that is shared. Thank you. Thanks very much, Charlotte. And uh, thank you also for being here. We also have Sisunor Industries joining from the industry perspective. We'll hear from them, obviously, during the roundtable. It's great to have a multi-stakeholder discussion, as we like to say, so that we can ensure that any kind of practice and futurely regulation is balanced. Because at the end of the day, we don't want to engage in any activity that compromises the very entities that are basically enabling the development of the moon. So I fully subscribe on the need to have a balanced solution. And I do think that there are, especially in information sharing, many opportunities for doing that. And I look forward to hear everyone's opinion uh, on this. And last but not least, uh, quite the opposite, if anything, I'd like to turn to Professor Stephen Freeland, who will uh, tie uh, the how and the, hmm. the what and the why of information sharing through uh, his insights on processes that we can follow with particular reference, of course, to the uh, work of the working group that has already been mentioned and that Professor Freeland uh, is vice chair of. Stephen, thank you so much for joining from Islamabad, if I'm correct. Uh, the floor sure. is yours. We look forward to your interventions. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Antonino. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm sorry I can't be uh, over there in Paris, but as uh, Antonino mentioned, I'm here um, as part of a leadership development forum for the heads of agencies of 12 countries um, of the world. And part of that forum will, in fact, talk on precisely the issues relating to um, lunar resource activities, amongst other things. So there's a lot of information sharing uh, taking place over here, and I'm, I'm delighted with the theme of this forum. Thank you also so much to the organisers for inviting me to uh, contribute. Um, really, what I'm going to say is um, from a multilateral perspective, but, but a few motherhood statements as well, which hopefully will set the theme. Uh, obviously, the, the opportunities uh, that present themselves with technological development for resource uh, activities uh, have generated a lot of excitement amongst industry. We've heard uh, just then from Charlotte, amongst uh, governments, we've heard from Emily, amongst many, many people in civil society. And I see Tanya in the room. Um, Tanya, uh, amongst many others in civil society, has led this excitement and this, these debates. But it involves many issues. It's a complex issue. Apart from governance issues and legal issues, obviously, uh, there are technical issues, very significant technical challenges. There are, as we have just heard, uh, intense commercial interests. This is a deeply political issue as well. It has very significant environmental consequences. It's about science, of course. It raises a number of significant ethical issues and notions of equitable sharing and all of the, that. 
And indeed, if we look at the Outer Space Treaty to which Emily referred, Article 1, Paragraph 1, front and centre, talks about activities essentially being for the benefit of all humanity. And that's a significant issue. So all of those factors just in and of themselves tell us that, as Emily quite rightly said, uh, we humble lawyers and regulators really don't understand so much of the relevant information that we need to ask the right questions right at the beginning before one can even attempt to, be, to come up with answers, answers that make sense. And remember those answers, and I'll talk about the working group in a minute, those answers that, in my opinion, should be formed at a multilateral level those solutions, if it's a framework, if it's an instrument, if it's a code of conduct, if it's guidelines, if it's anything else, that solution is not to last us for five years. That solution is to last us for 30, 50 years as we move forward in a framework where technology is so rapidly developing. So there's an element of, if you, if you like, regulating for the unknown and that's a difficult issue and again, calls dramatically for the need for as much information as possible from all relevant sectors. In my opinion, and the United Nations uh, Working Group and the discussions at COPOS really, I think, emphasize this. Uh, in the end, a multilateral agreement, and I don't mean agreement necessarily in a binding sense, but a multilateral understanding about rules of the road is essential to cover all of those aspects. From my perspective, at least, and this is obviously, I think, underpinning the consensus that we've reached thus far at the UN, to have different groups of countries or companies or others engaging in activities in, as Emily said, close geographical proximity in a hazardous area under different rules leads to increased risks for miscalculations, misunderstandings, and worse. And I think that is not a solution that anyone wants. So we have to get it right. We need to understand there have been so many inputs from so many different sectors that are relevant. Inputs from industry, as we've just heard. Inputs from broader civil society, inputs from academia, inputs in relation to national initiatives and bilateral initiatives. And if I may use the expression, minilateral initiatives. Um, all of those inputs have wonderful ideas. There's also the international framework. Emily's mentioned the Outer Space Treaty. As an Australian, of course, it behoves me also to mention the Moon Agreement, which also covers uh, and raises many ideas in this area. So there's a lot of information we need to get. We need to hear all of these voices. And from the multilateral perspective, we need to hear those voices still respecting the fact that the UN process that I have the honour of co-chairing is an intergovernmental process. And so we have to find ways, and we are finding ways, to ensure that you respect that, but on the, at the same time, you allow for as much informed information from experts from all sectors to join in and be part of that discussion so that any discussions then amongst the member states uh, the 100 plus member states um, will be as fully informed as possible. And you see that in the mandate already of the working group, um, which was agreed by consensus last year. And the first paragraph of the mandate of our working group, and we've already begun this exercise, is to collect relevant information concerning activities, possible activities on the lunar surface, on celestial bodies regarding resources, with respect to the scientific and technical developments and the current practices. So we're already mandated to do exactly what this roundtable is discussing, sharing information, not relying solely on the member states to act without any 
recourse to other information. But as I said, we need to do that within the intergovernmental process. So um, I don't know whether you can hear there's a call for prayer outside my hotel window just starting. So you may hear that in the background. Um, I'll stop there, Anthony, now and pass it back to you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Stephen, and uh, you gave us so much to reflect on. I just like to underline the need to have, at the same time, this multilateral discussions, but also multi-stakeholder discussion. And I think uh, one of the things that we'd like to do at the Open Lunar Foundation is exactly facilitating the integration between uh, the two of them and the reason why we're here. So without further ado, I'd like to open for open uh, discussion among the participants to the round table. If anyone would like to take the floor commenting, I think we have a lot to, <laughs> to discuss and so little time to do. Uh, so please, uh, everyone, Ian Christensen, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Ian Christensen with the, the Secure World Foundation. Um, thank you to all of the, the interventions uh, thus far. So, uh, Anthony, you know, where, where I want to start is so the, the name of our session, of our round table today, is Enhanced information sharing. And I think to enhance information sharing, we need to kind of assess where we're at with information sharing to begin with. And I think in the lunar context, that's fairly limited, right? Um, Charlotte, you mentioned some of the types of information that the private company like yours might uh, consider sharing. Um, comparing that with the LEO environment where we have um, relatively robust, although not complete space situational awareness data, and mechanisms like the Space Data Association and others to share operator um, data. We do not have any of that in the lunar context. And so I think one of the things we need to think about as a group is as initial pioneering activities occur on the moon, we're gonna have to rely upon operator data, whether that's the commercial data or government data to build some of this initial data sharing infrastructure that we need for safety and interoperability. So. We're starting from a fairly limited information point, and to enhance that, we uh, we should we should recognize that. So, uh, very briefly, purposes of information sharing. I think we've heard some of that already. Um, safety is a key driver, of course. Um, I think establishing the types of interests that operators on the moon might have in terms of uh, commerce, in terms of exploration, in terms of science, is a is a purpose of information sharing. Determining national priorities, right? I think is a purpose of information sharing, and then building capacity. I think is important, right? And that's regulatory capacity, that's scientific capacity, that's industry capacity. So, uh, a number of us at this table are part of something known as the Global Expert Group on Sustainable Lunar Activities, uh, which is coming out with a set of recommended principles. And there's a number of things in there that talk about information sharing, and they kind of talk about them as a starting point for building an infrastructure of, uh, of, of commerce and, and safety on the moon. And so I think that's the context um, I think about uh, information sharing. And so in the interest of time, I'll stop there. Thanks, Ian. Um, I fully support the idea of thinking about the SSA aspect of information sharing, because in the end, we need to gather this information. We don't have eyes on the moon at the moment, and I think that's something that operators can fill this gap somehow by providing their own data, but I think it also provides for nice, interesting business opportunities because at the moment, in fact, we are blind and we need to rely on uh, what others are telling us. So that's going to be for sure a complementary activity to keep in mind in parallel to the regulatory processes. Paolo, yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Paolo Pino from the Space Generation Advisory Council. Uh, just wanted to perhaps substantiate all these great uh, inputs to our conversation with uh, a few of the technical outcomes of our work uh, with the, the technical unit on uh, lunar technology that was started within HGAC. And, um, and speaking about the types of information that can be shared also uh, in consideration of the needs of uh, private actors, um, I guess that based on the studies we've done, especially on landing activities, uh, we could imagine perhaps several stages in this process where certain types of information when shared might actually create values for all stakeholders. And so for instance, when it comes to lending selection, so the very first process, things like uh, the characteristics, the features of the terrain, the slope, the illumination patterns, all those might inform the decision of those who need to carry a lunar mission. And that perhaps already creates uh, somehow uh, a map of where missions might land and uh, what can be expected out of the, the forthcoming activity. We also found out that also the particle size distribution, how the regolith is made, how large those particles are, might have an impact on the surrounding activities because that are projected by the landing plume of landers. And so knowing that and sharing that information might be relevant for private 
private players, public players as well, because that might cause harm to, to other missions. And then when it comes to the landing operation itself, that's extremely risky. So far, the failure rates have been very high, like in the order of 50% or something. And that, uh, that risk might be reduced if uh, more information are available on, uh, the, on what's present on the surface, for instance. So in addition to services like communication and positioning and, and timing, um, perhaps if um, lunar maps could be updated with the actual uh, photograph and images and visual data of the landers and the assets that are present, those might act as reference point that can inform the high precision landing algorithms that can really be a game changer when it comes to crowding the South Pole and, and being present there. And uh, that might be critical also for hard landing. So when more satellites are going to be there at end of life, a strategy for some of them might just be hard landing on the surface of the moon. And so uh, identifying places where this can happen safely is going to be extremely important. We don't want to happen perhaps close to s some activity that's going on in that, in that moment. And, and to conclude, of course, uh, once landing is done successfully, there are going to be activities there taking place. And perhaps in this context, uh, sharing information on standards and interfaces um, that we might use, uh, that can be important as well. Might have some benefits for private companies as well. And an example that really stood out for us was um, that related to scientific payloads that are so important for the initial commercial activities in the forthcoming years. If we establish common electrical interfaces, thermal or mechanical interfaces for all these payloads, then the providers of logistics and transport services will have somehow a larger pie, a larger market, a possibility to address and serve more of those payloads. And that will create perhaps the conditions for a healthier competition, as well as for development of niches where new actors might uh, come into play and, and, and address those, those needs and customers. Thank you. Thanks, Paolo. And um, I'd like to come back to what Charlotte and Emily mentioned before. Like, I think we all agree at this point that there is a need for enhanced information sharing, that we're starting from a very low point and that we need to do better. The question then becomes really how and how different stakeholders, I'm very happy that at this round table we have different representation. We have governments, we have companies, we have civil society, we have academics, so we have different groups that can all individually contribute to information sharing. The question is, how do we host this information in a way that is meaningful and makes sense? So a question for all of you is, uh, should we have like one centralized process and database hosting this information, like Emily mentioned Article 11 of the Aerospace Treaty that feeds at, at, at an index developed by the United Nations and maintained by the UN Office for Aerospace Affairs. If you take a look at that, it's not really in great shape, I must say, because it's just a list of PDF submissions, so it's not really useful for any coordination or um, cooperation enabling type of activity. So maybe we could start restructuring that and how do we get to that point? But then what about commercial actors, right? Uh, Charlotte mentioned the importance of involving the interest of commercial players. I would say that we should also have a way for commercial actors to share information themselves, not necessarily through states or the diplomatic channels, or maybe integrating the two of them. So I'm curious to hear thoughts uh, from anyone at the round table on how do we really begin sharing information? Like what should be the processes and where do we host this information in a way that makes sense and can be useful for the purpose of coordination, cooperation and transparency? Tanya. Thank you. Uh, maybe I'll try to um, provide some thoughts on that <clears throat> that also came from the Hague Working Group. I brought some of the uh, booklets if anyone is interested. We developed a number of building blocks that is on the table also in the international processes where we actually made a distinction between two kinds of uh, registry uh, on the one hand and a database on the other hand, a registry to uh, register, for instance, priority rights about uh, uh, sites where companies or governments want to exercise space resource activities, uh, which then also would bring international recognition because that is, if you like, the commercially uh, attractive point that if you are going to invest into technology, you also want uh, to have certain protection of your investment, obviously. On the other hand, you could look at having a, a publicly available database where you uh, register 
uh, maybe advance notification of uh, activities, but also uh, sites that are of specific cultural or heritage interest, mm -hmm. sites that are of specific scientific interest, so more the publicly available um, uh, information. And of course, I uh, fully agree with Charlotte when she says you need an independent um, authority, institution, company, whatever, organization to uh, to do that. And also there has to be uh, a way of monitoring it. I think an interesting parallel is uh, to make with perhaps the Cape Town Convention on the Protection of Mobile Assets, which has uh, uh, a space protocol, which is unfortunately not in force, but there's also an aircraft protocol where there is such an international registry that has been set up where um, uh, priority rights or rights about on aircraft can be uh, can be registered and then you get international recognition. Another interesting parallel, I think, is the ITU process, the International Telecommunication Union, where there is a process of advanced notification and publication uh, and then protection, uh, registration in a registry, and then you are entitled to protection. So I think there are several precedents that we can uh, look at and examples. Uh, and of course, always commercial interest, but also security interest. There are also, of course, export control aspects that may prevent certain information from, uh, from uh, becoming public. But uh, in the end, and I like that Emily also referred to the Outer Space Treaty, as did Stephen, um, there is an, a treaty obligation to share information, which is, of course, not absolute. We have to find the way uh, to do it. But let's think about the two distinct kinds of information, and let's also think about the independent authority and monitoring capabilities. Thanks a lot, Tanya. I think Lots of comments that I have, but I know that Gina uh, wanted to previously intervene, so I'll give her the floor first. <laughs> Thank you, Antonino. Yes, I'm uh, Gina Petrovic. I'm working for the German Space Agency in the UN Affairs Department, so you won't be surprised if I underline that we attach great importance to discussing at the UN, and we are very pleased about uh, the Space Resources Working Group and about having Stephen here today with us. Um, yes, we think that the coherent global approach is needed um, based on the UN space treaties that were mentioned before, but then also further developed at the UN, for example, in the set of principles and the space resources working group to ensure that we all have the same understanding and can play by the same rules. But at the same time, this also means a sincere, intelligent and also visionary multilateral dialogue, including also the views of the different stakeholders, meaning not only state actors and space agencies, but as we do today, also having industry representatives, uh, NGOs, uh, academics uh, among us on the table discussing the needs and expectations that they have so that we know what we are actually regulating and what kind of principles we want to draft because these are the activities that are going to happen and we need to understand what is the framework that is needed for that. And this also applies to information sharing. So. Um, and this is definitely important for us. And then, yes, we already talked about Article 11 and how important it will be to raise awareness um, for the need to share more information also proactively and maybe to improve the process that we have in place, not only having individual PDF uh, papers submitted, but uh, a more sincere approach uh, that we can all follow. Thanks, Jean, and that obviously Yes, not to criticize the UN in itself, but obviously uh, so far the engagement also in information sharing under Article 11 has not been very active. So in a way, there wasn't a need to develop a platform that showcases the information. But I think as we recognize the need and as we will hopefully engage more and more in information sharing, we definitely need to think about not only how do we share, but how do we structure the information that is shared so that it's meaningful and accessible uh, for the purposes that we discussed. I'd like to go to Paul, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Paul Wild, and I'm here representing the International Association for the Advancement of Space Safety. As president of that organization, I have the privilege to lead hundreds of space safety professionals from around the globe. We are also permanent observers at the United Nations, so we provide advice and recommendations in that forum. Last month, we conducted a conference that was physically in Beijing about lunar search and rescue. 
And thankfully, our Chinese colleagues were nice enough to conduct that, at least the live sessions, from 7 p.m. to 11 p.m. their time, so I could join from Washington, D.C. at 7 a.m. Uh, and in that way, of course, we were able to have participation from, from all our members around the globe. I must gratefully acknowledge the uh, contributions from Professor Luau, of the Beijing Institute of Technology and our executive director, Tommaso Scoba, formerly the ESA head of safety in the um, organization of that conference. At that conference, we identified a number of legal and technical challenges and potential <clears throat> solutions that we could achieve a higher level of safety through redundancy of dissimilar systems. So, of course, we know that the United States is leading with the Artemis Accords, a coalition, but separately that the Chinese and the Russians are pursuing their efforts as well. But if we could collaborate, communicate, we could establish, for example, the frequency and format of an emergency distress message. We could um, exchange information like we have with the International Space Station on what a hatch, a standard hatch would be so that, you know, any, whether you're an astronaut or a tachynaut or a cosmonaut, could enter a particular facility uh, to provide assistance. We need to communicate and cooperate this lunar search and rescue, so for example, we could have compatible life support umbil umbilicals. Um, so there's a lot of lessons that can be learned from studying actually what's happened on Earth with the submarines. So there's, there's an international organization for uh, submarine Escape and Rescue Liaison Office, I smell them. And clearly, <clears throat> they've been dealing with sensitive objects, right? Submarines usually intended to be secret. <laughs> and yet, when we have trouble on the high seas, we've been able to put aside our differences and treat each other as human beings and collaborate um, to, to rescue those, those human beings. So um, the IAAS will be presenting a position paper at the Copius um, to put forward some ideas based on uh, these lessons learned. And of course, what we want to do is build a voluntary coalition to develop consensus-based uh, solutions to these technical and legal challenges. And my experience has been that if we can gather in, in an um, informal setting first as, as engineers and, and lawyers, um, collect our ideas, and then feed those to the diplomats. Uh, we tend to get better results faster. And so I invite all of you to join us as we endeavor to make the moon and and outer space um, reflective of our highest values as humans, in particular, the preservation of human life. Thank you. Thanks very much, Paul. Uh, well, time flies when we have fun. <laughs> we only have 15 minutes left. So I'd like to turn to our second issue and uh, give the floor to Gary uh, to talk about next steps, right? I think uh, one thread that I see emerging from this discussion is uh, the need to find practical steps that we can take to begin, uh, let's say, operationalizing information sharing. And I like Tanya's suggestion of going forward with maybe two different type of approaches. One that's more of a formal consequence uh, that could be engaged and lead by states and the UN Office for Outer Space Affairs, and then in parallel having um, multi-stakeholder civil society initiatives for database that can support and complement in a way that process. So that's definitely an interesting model. Uh, and obviously the importance of interoperability uh, that can be enabled by an information sharing. It's a further purpose also for commercial actors to continue um, engage with that. So I'd like to turn to uh, Gary Kalnan, Chief Executive Officer of Cisnunar Industries, um, that will kick us off for uh, initial remarks and priority areas for 
uh, further next steps in the context of these groups, specifically on uh, enhanced information sharing. There we go. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, thanks for including us in this discussion. I very much appreciate the opportunity um, to put a little bit, to give some context around, you know, wh where we're coming from as a, as a company. Um, Cisler Industries is building space-based metal processing technology, uh, which we see as enhancing or enabling a sustainable and circular economy in space, uh, both in orbit and on the surface of the moon. So I'd like to sort of highlight some of this, uh, the idea of sustainability and, and build off that piece of it and enhanced uh, information sharing around that as possibly a template for um, other areas of, of the industry. Obviously, there's many you know, uh, companies, different industries that are going to develop on the moon, and we're all going to have to collaborate in, in various ways, um, but this is our main piece of the puzzle. <clears throat> So as a recycler, uh, well, metal processor, one of the things we can do is enable recycling of resources that are already there. And, and when I think about um, optimizing uh, and building a sustainable circular economy on the moon, uh, part of what we need to do is understand what's available to process. And as we develop our technology, where we are in our phase of development is building this technology right now um, at the early stages, about to do a parabolic flight, for example, uh, to test it in microgravity. So we're moving up the technical ladder um, and it would, it would be useful to understand uh, what people, other entities are bringing to the surface of the moon in terms of the material composition, not necessarily the specific IP that they have developed for, you know, their particular commercial interest, but what the composition of the materials are. And I would also advocate for, you know, sharing from our side what the uh, capabilities are that we are building. So, for example, we will find out what kinds of materials we can more easily process, what kinds of uh, you know, configurations of spacecraft are easier to disassemble or reuse or repurpose or salvage and then process further. Um, and so by sharing what we, what we are capable of, perhaps we can influence companies to make design choices that would further enable uh, a circular economy on the moon so we're not creating a new trash pile in, in the new environment that we go to. We can actually start that from the outset, um, creating this circular economy, which I, I really think will actually enhance and optimize the development of, of the lunar economy and allow us to move even faster because we can utilize all the resources we're bringing to the surface. So that's just one, you know, one possible way of doing that. And next, actual tangible steps in 2023, you know, we can already start to sh openly share some of the results we're getting from our research into what's capable for being recycled, as an example. Thank you, Gary. And I like the emphasis on information sharing in this case for cooperation and business development, which I think is also a critical aspect that we need to underline. It's not just about safety or transparency. It's also that information is powerful and it's useful for business. And I like also the two-way streets approach. It's not just pretending that others share information, but we first as an actor want to engage with information sharing. And I think that's a sign of good faith uh, that will hopefully incentivize others to do the same. So um, hopefully we can all agree on this approach. Now, looking at what this group can do in 2023, obviously we have here uh, Tanya and Ian that uh, develop a great blueprint within the context of the PPF in terms of what are the engagements that this group could promote. Um, there is obviously the possibility of working on many aspects like developing a case for information sharing and enhance information sharing in terms of what information could be useful uh, and what things could be dangerous, as Charlotte mentioned, so that things that we do not want to go and maybe that we do not need to go. I would say, again, it could be useful to elaborate on not just removing information sharing, but explaining that it's maybe not needed. And so framing it also in that, in that way. And then um, collectively work on potential processes or suggestions for processes that could be helpful in terms of information sharing. Uh, that is also probably a valuable contribution and then begin ourselves to collect this information and feed existing processes like the one um, at the United Nations in terms of uh, information gathering that will begin and support substantive discussion. Um, so I would like to hear thoughts on the table of what could be steps uh, that proactively can be taken within this context. Obviously, there are different initiatives. So focusing on what the PPF can bring and the type of commitment that are already taken here um, could be useful to think to uh, provide added value to discussions that are already happening. Yes, Paul. 
I'll put on my other hat as uh, Chief Engineer uh, for Commercial Space at the Federal Aviation Administration and say that um, when it comes to data sharing, um, we've been able to overcome some of the, the reluctance of the industry to share in particular their performance data, um, not only with us, but even with their competitors um, by forming what we call data trusts. So a data trust is administered by a third party. Um, in our case, it's uh, for, for the SIS program, it's the MITRE Corporation, which is a, a um, federally funded research and development corporation. And uh, so the idea is that the companies provide their information. It's, it's this neutral third party. And the um, use of it is uh, limited, but um, it gets de-identified so that the FAA as a regulator can go in and, and see, you know, trends and anomalies, et cetera, and um, get ahead of the curve, be proactive in terms of the things that would help uh, with, with safety. And that information is also shared with those who contribute, right? So the companies get to see um, this data lake, but um, carefully de-identified to uh, protect their pro proprietary information. Sounds like a very interesting approach, Ian. Yeah, so uh, brief comment. I think looking at the forum that, that we're at, I think one of the, the, the unique attributes of the, the PPF is the political level that it exists at and the, the cross-sectoral um, representation that, that this forum accesses. And I think um, one of the things that you might think about or this group might think about in terms of leveraging this forum for, for further work on, on, on linear data sharing is how can this forum be used to bring in uh, perspectives from emerging space nations or um, non-spacefaring countries, right? Because looking around this, this table and looking around just the general lunar um, development community, it is, it is does tend to sometimes be a conversation of the traditional spacefaring countries. And so a forum like this can, and, and, and that's natural, right? Because that's an expression of the state of technology and the state of capabilities, right? But this is a forum where bringing in data and perspectives from um, emerging nations and, and, and non-spacefaring nations can contribute to a, to a broader and more inclusive lunar, um, lunar development pathway. So but I don't know what that looks like tactically in terms of inflation, but I think there's a, there's a potential at this forum to, to, to do that. Yes, <laughs> thank you. And Ian, I just want to underline the importance of that comment because in a way, oh yeah, we have Stephen Freeland. Uh, yeah, yeah, then, then the importance of, I think, ensuring that we can hear also other voices because information sharing also starts with this multi-stakeholder process. Uh, yeah, I'd like to turn to Professor Stephen Freeland. I think you're muted or we don't uh, hear you. Yeah. There you go. Uh, we in, lost your in, video. In, in, <laughs> Uh, there we go. In go the ahead. interest yeah. of information sharing, I don't want to. I don't want to uh, um, mean that someone who hasn't spoken um, isn't heard. So, but in, in I just have four very quick quick points to make. Um, uh, firstly, uh, information sharing. If you look at our um, our situation with the uh, increasing problems of space debris, one of the basic things that sometimes startles me is we don't have a telephone directory. You know, who do you call when something, uh, when there's a real issue? Now, I, of course, uh, obviously, I'm being a bit simplistic here. But um, uh, as we develop the need for information sharing when it comes to lunar activities and elsewhere, I think part of that will be trying to make sure there's a, a ready database of, um, of points of contact or whatever, so that if there are issues that arise immediately, you know who the other person or the other relevant people are. You know, as I said, it amazes me that we don't do that well in the space debris arena, but that's another point. Secondly, we need to talk. Um, I love the comment that was made about we've got to learn what's happening on Earth. We need to talk to, for example, mining companies on Earth, and I know people do. 
Why do I say that? Every mining company has three main divisions. And I, again, I generalize for this for the sake of time. They have an exploration division. They have a, if I may use the expression, extraction division. And they have the third division. We've had a lot of talk about exploration and extraction in the context of lunar resources. The third division every mining company has is a remediation rehabilitation division. What do you do when you've finished? And how do you then look at trying to redress? There is no discussion of great substance on the international level on that third issue. And again, it's up to member states, what are their priorities? But by talking to terrestrial companies involved in this, we can learn that there's a full picture. Thirdly, um, the working group, um, as people in the room will know, has written to the 100 plus member states, the 40 plus permanent observers, um, essentially saying to them, you tell us what sort of activities, what sort of scope, what sort of resources, as a beginning for the working group. And all of that information will be made publicly available, uh, both, both uh, in total and then at, by way of summary prior to legal subcommittee. That then allows for a discussion amongst member states as to where to from there. We've got a, an initial base of where the, the member states and permanent observers are. Following that, we will find ways already in our mandate about conferences and workshops um, that will allow for other voices, the non-governmental voices. Now, of course, we won't be able to hear from everybody, which is why all of the conversations that have been referred to today are important. Uh, and I encourage those conversations, but there will be opportunities, there must be opportunities for that information to filter through into the formal processes. And so, um, if I may say, I encourage and thank everybody in the room, uh, particularly those from uh, from the member states, but everybody for supporting the working group. Um, there's been tremendous good faith to get consensus, but I encourage you all to keep uh, a watching brief, a close watching brief on those activities and ensure that you, through uh, whatever channels are appropriate for you, make sure that that input somehow is filtered into those broader discussions. Thank you, Antonina. Thanks a lot, Stephen. And I would say this also gives us a prompt for further discussion in 2023 on how we can continue to feed the multilateral process while also including and developing uh, complementary initiatives. I saw a request from the floor from one of our audience attendees. Uh, if you'd like to briefly introduce yourself um, in 30 seconds, that'd be great. Yes, thank you for that deadline of 30 seconds. So Azim Maherali, um, I, uh, I'm a knowledge, uh, knowledge diplomacy practitioner and we build knowledge bridges across knowledge silos. So this is coming to fore. Um, my observation from listening to all the experts in this room and leaders is um, really great to hear the democratization of space. And as you mature this paradigm of sharing, how will we ensure that we create enough room and space for new entrants and not make the pioneers um, how should I put it, have the monopoly on the conversations, right, or the information sharing. So uh, r really interesting paradigms. I liked uh, what uh, the gentleman with the satellite in the background uh, from Islamabad said. We've talked about exploration, and that has been the history of humanity, exploring, going into space, new, new lands, etc., but also extraction, right, because that uh, drives the commercial value. But I would like to leave our, um, our members in this room with the idea of trusteeship. If we, if we mature this dialogue and carry that further on, then the remediation part becomes a great enhancer of opportunity and new, uh, new lunar economies. That can become a model for Earth-centric businesses, right? That we messed up Earth, we don't have planet B, but you know, we're gonna do things better on the moon and bring that knowledge back to actually improve the condition of humanity here. So I think space becomes, and, and the moon becomes a really great platform to do things differently, to do things better, to do things more ethically, and to do more things inclusively. Thank you.
Thank you very much. And I think that is a good reality check to hear from uh, non-space actors intervening and recognizing the value of the discussion also in terms of improving processes on Earth. Uh, we are basically at the end of our time. Uh, we have basically one minute to 45. I would like to thank everyone for your intervention. This has been an extremely interesting discussion. I think we have so much to reflect on. And I would uh, think that this group can really provide some added value contribution to the process next year. And uh, we would be delighted at Open Lunar to continue work with the PPF organizers. Uh, Maria and Jerome have done an amazing work putting this round table together. And uh, we are like privileged to hear and integrate your expertise. And hopefully we will be in touch about what can we discuss forward in 2023 and, and onwards to develop these enhanced practices that I think we all agree need. And it's just a matter of finding ways to promote them and provide them in the right way uh, for the sustainable and safe development of the moon. So we'd like, I'd like to conclude. Thank you all so very much and enjoy the rest of your forum. Bye-bye, everybody.